In this video, we're going to talk about free free emission, which is also known as Bremsstrahlung. Bremsstrahlung is just German for braking radiation. And that's braking as in the brakes on your car. So the picture here is that we have an ion, some charged nucleus with charge Z, interacting with a free streaming electron here with charge minus E. And the acceleration that results from their interaction is going to produce emission because any accelerated charge radiates power according to the equation P equals two-thirds E squared A squared over C cubed, where A is the acceleration. So let's examine what happens when a electron comes within a distance B of this nucleus here. Well, in that case, at that point, the acceleration of the electron is just given by the electric force divided by the mass of the electron. So the acceleration is going to be of order z e squared over b squared times the mass of the electron. So we can plug this acceleration in for a in this equation over here. We get the power is of order 2 thirds z squared e to the sixth over b to the fourth mass of the electron squared c cubed. Now of course this power is only radiated for a short amount of time during which the electron is interacting with this nucleus. We can estimate the amount of energy release in the encounter, E, as being approximately the power radiated over the time interval of the interaction. So P times delta T. And how do we estimate delta T? Well, we could assign a vo velocity V to this electron and assume that delta T is of order the time it takes to cross this interaction at length B. So it's crossing a distance of something like 2B at a velocity V. So if we plug that in for delta t and plug in this expression for the power, we get that the energy is of order 4 thirds c squared e to the sixth over b to the fourth me squared c cubed times b over v. Now we're going to do something kind of interesting. We're going to relate the distance b that the electron passes from the nucleus here. We're going to relate that b to a frequency. So as the electron passes by this nucleus, if we graph the direction of the electric force pulling on that electron, over here we'll see the force has a component along the path of the electron and a component that's perpendicular to the path of the electron. And the part that's perpendicular is what ultimately deflects the electron down in this direction. After the electron passes by, there's a force pulling in the opposite direction. Now if we examine around the, the point of closest approach of this electron to the nucleus here and just look at the component of this force that's pushing the electron along its path here. So if we plotted F parallel, the force parallel to the direction of the electron from the electron's perspective, over here it's pointing along the direction of flight of the electron. We have something that's pushing it along its flight. By the time it gets to this point of closest approach, there's no force pushing the electron along its path because the entire component is pulling perpendicular towards the nucleus. And then on the other side, we have a negative going force that's slowing the electron down. So by this kind of hand wavy argument, we have a force on this electron, an acceleration, which looks relatively sinusoidal. Of course, it's not a perfect sinusoid because these taper off here, they don't actually cross zero again. They're asym they asymptotically approach zero. But to first order, this looks something like a sine wave. And we could estimate the frequency of this sine wave, and we could estimate that one half the period of the sine wave, which I'll call capital T, is about the time that it takes the electron to go from this point minus b through zero up to positive b. The maximum force in the positive and negative directions comes when this force vector is pointing at a 45 degree angle. So that's about the amount of time that it takes to go a distance 2b at velocity v. So if I invert the period to get a frequency, I get that nu is of order v over 4b. And if we wanted to look at a differential interval here, we'd find that d nu is approximately minus v over 4b squared db. So all that we've really done here is argue that because the acceleration of this electron looks sinusoidal, and for linear systems, sinusoids in produce sinusoids out, we can relate the frequency of the emission that results from the acceleration of this electron to the distance at which the electron passed by the nucleus. So now let's do something else. Let's say instead of having just one electron passing by, we've got a whole bunch of electrons out here that are all cruising around 
past this nucleus. So they're all whizzing by in different directions. And we want to ask how many of those electrons are passing by at a distance b from the nucleus. And of course the differential fraction of electrons that are in some ring at distance b from the center is just given by 2 pi b times the differential width db of this ring. And so for the differential contribution to the power of those electrons, dp is going to be the energy emitted by those electrons, which are going at some velocity v at some distance b from the center, times the area of that ring, 2 pi b db, times the number density of the electrons, so how many electrons were in that ring, times the velocity those electrons are moving at. We need this extra velocity here to account for the increased interaction rate for electrons that are moving fast. This is the same idea of saying that the collision rate for electronic excitations is the average of n sigma v. Now you might wonder why we've chosen to examine a ring here instead of a shell. And the answer is a little hard to visualize, but we'll give it a shot. We're starting with the number density of electrons. We're asking how many of them pass by this atom at a distance b. If we selected only the electrons out of this cloud that were moving, say, from the left side of the page to the right side of the page, then for that fixed direction, we would only see emission from these electrons in one ring as it passes by the nucleus. Similarly, if we, started, if we selected only the electrons that were starting at the bottom of the page and moving up towards the top, those electrons also would only emit towards us as they pass through this ring. So if you divide your set of electrons up into, into sets of velocities that are all in the same direction, so all the electrons that are going in a similar direction, each one of those is only emitting over this region that's a, that's a ring. So when we sum over all of the different velocity directions that these electrons are traveling in, multiplied by the factor of the differential ring, when we add those all together, it's equal to the number density of the electrons times the same ring size for all of those different velocity directions. So that's why we end up with only a factor of a ring and not a shell. So now if we plug in for E, and we also plug in for dB, which is 4B squared over V d nu times the number density of electrons times their velocity, and we divide d nu over onto this other side, we get dp, the derivative of the power emitted with respect to frequency is of order 32 pi over 3, z squared e to the sixth, and e, our b's cancel, over me squared c cubed times one factor of velocity in the denominator. So this is interesting. This is saying that the power emitted per frequency interval is independent of the distance at which the electron passes near to the nucleus. So there is no factor of b here. So now we need to deal with this factor of, of velocity here. But fortunately we have a good idea of what we should pick for velocities because as we've seen in previous lectures in a plasma the electron-electron collision rates are typically high enough to relax into a Maxwellian distribution pretty quickly. So we'll take our velocities to be distributed according to a Maxwellian, but we need to be a little careful with this Maxwellian because if an electron gets moving, is moving too slowly, it will actually get captured by this nucleus, and so this wouldn't be a free-free interaction. It would be captured. So there's a, a, a minimum velocity, and that minimum velocity should be such that the kinetic energy associated with that electron is of order the energy given off by the acceleration, which is in the form of a photon with energy h nu. So given that, we can now add up all the contributions of all the different velocities of electrons and their contribution to the power per unit frequency to get an ensemble average of the radiated power versus frequency, which is the integral over all velocities, but as we said, it's not literally all velocities. We have to start at some v min and go up to infinity of our previous expression for d power d nu times the fraction of electrons that are at this velocity for which d p d nu was computed, and we add up all those contributions over all the velocities. And it turns out when you go ahead and you do that integral, you get a numerical factor out here that has some square to pi's in it from integrating this v squared e to the something that depends on v squared, c squared, e to the sixth, number density of electrons, 
and our MEs are going to cancel a little bit, so we end up with just a factor of ME to the 3 halves here, C cubed, square root of KT, E to the minus H nu over KT. Where this H nu here now was just picked up because of the bounds of this integral starting at V min, corresponded to a frequency H nu. So now if we want to compute our emissivity, J sub nu, which comes from our radiative transport equation, the emissivity from free free emission is going to be this d power d nu radiated into 4 pi steradians. So we have the emissivity for free free emission being these numerical factors that we had up here, but whereas this was strictly power, j nu is the emissivity, which is a power per frequency per unit volume. The extra factor of volume we have here isn't just the number density of electrons, it's also the number density of protons. What we have here was essentially the radiation per one single nucleus. So now we have to count up all the number of nuclei per unit volume, which we'll just call NP, assuming that they're protons, times e to the minus h nu over kT. So this is the expression for emissivity from thermal Bremsstrahlung. And if you want to be really exact here, there's one more factor that you'd want to put in here. It's called the Gaunt factor, and it's a factor of pi over the square root of 3 times g bar of free free, which is a function of velocity and temperature. So this is just a quantum mechanical correction factor called the Gaunt factor, and it's of order unity. Now just to finish things off here, for every forward process there's a reverse process. It's possible for an electron to absorb a photon and become more energetic as it's interacting with a nucleus and gain energy through the process. So we can define an absorption coefficient alpha sub nu for free free emission which we'll define to be j sub nu divided by Planck function. So why do we divide by the Planck function here? Well this is just saying that we know that in the optically thick case the I sub nu should go to the source function S sub nu, which was J sub nu over alpha sub nu. So in, in, in the optically thick case for thermal radiation, that S sub nu is going to have to be B sub nu. So we essentially define the alpha such that this works out correctly. So now we've defined our absorption coefficient in terms of the emission coefficient for thermal Bremsstrahlung. And this describes a reverse process known as inverse Bremsstrahlung. And occasionally you may be interested in expressing this absorption coefficient in terms of an opacity. If you remember that an opacity kappa sub nu for free free absorption is equal to alpha nu over rho, the density. So this is in general going to be proportional to the number density of electrons and protons over the density. We have a 1 over the Planck function here, so we pick up a nu to the minus 3 here, factor from our Planck function of e to the h nu over kt minus 1. Then over here we get the factor from our thermal Bremsstrahlung, which we'll flip over and write down here as e to the h nu over kt. And so if we're just trying to get like a, a coarse scaling here, we'll, we'll just cancel these really quickly. And we'll assume that h nu is of order kt, so that nu is proportional to t. We get that this whole thing is proportional to Ne Np over the density times t to the minus 3 over square root of t. And we can say that Ne is generally proportional to the density rho, and number of protons is proportional to z times rho. So altogether, kappa nu for free free is generally going to be proportional to rho times t to the minus 3.5. And this is a result known as Kramer's opacity. And Kramer's opacity is a commonly used result for describing interactions in stellar interiors and in accretion disk interiors. And the coefficient of proportionality here, the kappa is rho over t to the 3.5 times 3 times 10 to the 23rd centimeters squared 
per gram. So this is Kramer's opacity, which describes the scaling of opacity with the density and temperature of a plasma. And that opacity comes from an absorption that comes from inverse Bremsstrahlung, which is the reverse process of the thermal Bremsstrahlung that we just described. So that's Bremsstrahlung and inverse Bremsstrahlung. And it's important at this point to review the assumptions that we made to get here. For one, we assumed a Maxwellian velocity distribution of the electrons. But that should be valid because the collision time scale is very small for electrons. And so this system should relax into a, a Maxwellian velocity distribution very quickly. The other assumption we've made here is it's kind of implicit. This entire derivation was made in a non-relativistic regime. So we're making an assumption about the maximum temperature that this plasma is at. And that temperature comes out to be something about 10 to the 10 Kelvin. Uh, and this is an okay assumption for most plasmas, but there is a separate phenomenon called relativistic Bremsstrahlung, which you have to consider for some of the more esoteric regions where you have to consider relativistic effects. But for most H2 regions in our galaxy and for the diffuse intergalactic medium, thermal Bremsstrahlung in the non-relativistic case is a fine assumption.